On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including SpaceX's preparations for orbital domination, Northrop Grumman partners with Firefly Aerospace, and scientists think bacteria might be feeding off Venus's sulfur clouds. There's lots to go over this week, so let's get going. This is the Space Race. SpaceX has had a wild week of launches, construction, and testing as they ramp up preparations for the first orbital launch attempt of their groundbreaking Starship rocket. The biggest feature of which was a much anticipated static fire engine test of not just Booster 7, but also Ship 24. This past week saw several other major milestones for SpaceX, and together, they are all painting the picture of a company preparing for an unprecedented amount of work in space. To set the scene though, we need to quickly cover what everyone's been talking about, the static fire of S24 and B7. Booster 7 has been tied up with repairs after a recent explosion during a test of the booster's turbo pumps, but a series of tweets from CEO Elon Musk showed the repaired rocket making its way to the launch stand early Saturday. Not much was known beforehand about the test, but we knew from the road closure schedule that Monday the 8th was planned as a primary date for testing, with the following Tuesday and Wednesday planned as potential dates for backups. We also had Elon's tweet, which showed that it would involve only 20 of the booster's Raptor 2 engines a change that follows the new protocols put into place as a result of the explosion last month. But even without the full complement, a live fire test with 20 Raptors represents the most powerful engine burn ever produced. 20 Raptor 2 engines would produce close to 4,600 tons of thrust, in comparison to the Saturn V, whose first stage put out about 3,900 tons. And while a full 20 engine burn wasn't in the cards, we still got a show, as the SpaceX team fired not only B-7, but also the nearby S-24 on Tuesday. The burn ended up making use of only one of B-7's Raptor 2 engines instead of the full 20 Elon mentioned, and ran for just a couple of seconds, showing off that cool looking burn pattern Raptor is known for. But SpaceX wasn't content to stop at just B-7, and soon after that, Ship 24 also completed a quick static fire with two engines. And here's where we start to see the hints that there's more going on here. B-7 and S-24 both fired only part of their engine complements, and only after successfully completing some spin prime tests the day before. Then on Thursday, two full days after the initial static fire, we got to see B7 light its single Raptor 2 engine for a full 20 second burn. While impressive, it's a little confusing. Why is SpaceX suddenly being so cautious? It could have a lot to do with the July 11th spin prime test on B7, the one that resulted in that big explosion and forced the booster back to the repair bay. The explosion was due to some miscalculations about how much venting there would be with so many Raptor 2 engines. The exhaust accidentally ignited, and that was that. SpaceX has since updated their procedures to account for this. One of the reasons for the caution, certainly, but that can't be all. It's important to remember that SpaceX still hasn't gotten a launch license from the FAA, and they won't until they finish testing at the very least. The most recent talk from Elon is that an orbital test flight will happen within the next 12 months, which is quite a change from the frantic push for a launch in June or July or August. No one was really betting on such an early launch considering how testing was coming along, but it is probably a relief for SpaceX engineers to not have a summer launch date hanging over their heads, although the new timeline certainly doesn't rule it out. So maybe the extra caution was about methodically testing B-7 now that SpaceX isn't sprinting for a summer launch. That would make sense, seeing as how the FAA is watching the testing very closely. But that's definitely not the only major action happening for SpaceX right now. On Tuesday the 9th, while all eyes were on Boca Chica, 
a Falcon 9 lifted off, carrying another batch of Starlink satellites into orbit. Nothing special there on first glance, but a breakdown of the total mass sent to orbit in just quarter two this year tells a shockingly different story. The data shows SpaceX has sent over 158 metric tons into orbit. That is more than every other space agency combined twice. In just Q2 this year, they blew past last year's benchmark for launch cadence back in July, which is a stark comparison to the caution they seem to be showing with their super heavy testing. And that's because SpaceX's goal is way more than just an orbital flight test. They plan on being the space company. When talking about super heavy, Elon has always mentioned how quick he expects launches to be set up, fired, returned, and reset for the next run. And if Falcon can already lift more than double what every other rocket does combined, imagine if SpaceX can get super heavy to achieve the 1,000 times capacity that Elon boasts about. Any of the company's upcoming projects, be it Starlink V2, the Artemis missions, Mars explorations, or just orbital construction plans, are planned to be on the back of this gigantic beast of a rocket but it's a rocket that can't fly just yet. So the idea seems to be that SpaceX can train its personnel and test its new facilities using their current workhorse, the Falcon 9, all while some much more careful testing is being done in the background. Starbase and Pad 39A in Florida are under major construction. Roofs are being put onto rocket factories, high bays are being finished, and giant towers are being pieced together, all in anticipation of the blistering pace of work that SpaceX has said it is planning. That's the picture that was being painted last week. As all of that was happening behind the fiery scene of the first static fire of Booster 7 and Ship 24. A slower start, maybe, but all things considered, it's better to see SpaceX take their time and focus on the testing. Starship and Super Heavy are likely going to be the most prolific workhorse rocket of the next decade. SpaceX doesn't have to rush to orbit to prove how competent they are. The blast marks at Boca Chica tell that story more than well enough. All might not be lost for the Antares rocket, as aerospace giant Northrop Grumman announced on August 8th, that they had partnered with the beleaguered Firefly Aerospace to help re-outfit their rocket. Antares has been contracted by NASA since roughly 2013 to fly resupply missions to the International Space Station and Cygnus cargo vehicle. But that all changed when Russia attacked Ukraine. Antares was equipped with booster tanks from Ukraine, which obviously can't produce them right now, and Russian RD-181 rocket engines for its first stage, well, as soon as the sanctions hit, Roscosmos stopped supplying U.S. companies, which meant groups like the United Launch Alliance and, of course, Northrop Grumman were out of luck. Now, the ULA already had enough supply to finish their Atlas V launches and move on to their Vulcan rocket, but Northrop Grumman only had enough for two more launches. So, enter Firefly Aerospace. Firefly has had a rocky history to say the least. While the company has produced some cool space tech, most of their press has been about their former CEO, Tom Markusik, and their founder, Max Polyakov. There was corporate espionage, bankruptcy, explosions, and the dramatic departures of both of these leading men. Honestly, we may need to do another video on the wild history of Firefly. Let us know in the comments if you'd like that. But for now, we're going to focus on what the newly reorganized company is doing with Northrop Grumman. Antares needs a first stage booster, and the engines to launch it, and Firefly has just the thing. Reportedly, Antares' redesigned first stage will now be powered by seven Miranda engines, each capable of about 1,020 kilonewtons of force. This will give Antares a boost to its lift capacity and make it roughly on par with Firefly's prototype beta rocket. This is an interesting pairing. Firefly has a lot to prove, but Northrop Grumman is a big name in aerospace right now. So we'll be keeping our eyes on the next Antares launch. 
Venus is a weird planet. Most of us have heard the basic stats. A Venetian day lasts longer than its year. Its surface is a blistering 462 degrees Celsius. It rains sulfuric acid and is very bright in our sky. Those last two are actually related to the subject of a new line of research into our sister planet. Venus's thick sulfuric acid clouds reflect a lot of sunlight, which is what makes it the brightest thing in our sky aside from the sun and moon. But there are patches where the UV radiation gets absorbed and not reflected. A new computational model has used a chemistry technique to break down what is likely to be happening, and it leads to some exciting theories. The model suggests that disulfur is responsible. Disulfur is an allotrope of regular elemental sulfur, basically a form of sulfur that is shaped differently at the molecular structure. Think of it like how diamonds are technically carbon, just formed differently at the molecular scale. Disulfur tends to cause the formation of more and more different forms of allotropes, and those differently shaped sulfurs can reflect or absorb light to varying degrees. That's what the new models are suggesting is the reason for those patches of Venetian atmosphere that are absorbing light. But it's still unclear how those disulfur molecules are forming, or if that's even the real reason. One of the reasons Venus has been in NASA's crosshairs for so long is that it's likely that life, albeit bacterial, is living in those clouds. Here on Earth, our clouds are full of various bacteria. But when scientists think of life on Venus, they're actually thinking deeper, like ocean vents sort of deep. Way down where vents form, there's also a proliferation of scalding heat and sulfur. And bacteria growing. These little guys cycle sulfur into oxidized variants, just like we see in Venus's atmosphere. And in addition to the various molecular forms of sulfur, the bacteria themselves would likely also absorb a lot of UV, leading to those dark spots. Now, this isn't a settled theory by any means, but the upper atmosphere of Venus is a pretty hospitable environment, and Given the parallels with bacterial life here, it's exciting to think that we might just be a few years away from discovering life outside of our planet. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.